The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now let me read a telegram to the Equitable Life Assurance Society from St. Louis. I quote, Dear Equitable, at discussion group meeting last Wednesday, your Equitable Society commercials were voted best on the air. No high-pressure selling, lots of facts and helpful information. Keep it up. Well, we are. Tonight's Equitable Society commercial will deal with a type of insurance that's important in the lives of one out of every three Americans. Yet most of you people who have it know almost nothing about it. So listen carefully in just 14 minutes to a message on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Runaway Dancer. Your FBI makes periodic studies of the field of crime in an effort to be better prepared to apprehend every criminal possible. And from each of those studies, certain facts are deduced. One of those facts is that there are no two criminals exactly alike, even as there are no two decent law-abiding citizens who are exactly alike. Yet there is at least one common characteristic among all criminals who commit crimes as a business, who try to make their living by stealing, lying, cheating, or killing. That common denominator is brutality. Brutality born of the constant effort to take what rightfully belongs to someone else. Brutality which has always accompanied every evidence of the lust that helps make some men criminals. The consuming lust for power. The night file opens in a shabby second floor dance hall located in the large western city. It is early evening. One of the hostesses is seated at a cornered table as another hostess approaches. Hi, Sally. Oh, hello, Peg. Oh, if I sit here a minute. Oh, my feet are killing me. Oh, that's a shame. How many tickets you got so far, kid? Three. Oh. Look, honey, do you mind if I tell you something? No. You're brand new here, and I've been at this thing a long time. So I, I feel entitled to give you a little advice. I wish you would. Honey, you don't spell enough. Spell? Yeah. Laugh, talk, turn it on. But, Peg, I try. Sweetheart, nothing comes out. Well, what do you suggest I do? I mean... What should I laugh and talk about? You talk about him. That's all the guys are ever interested in. Oh, you butter him up, you laugh at his jokes, and you don't look so sad. You just got to remember, there'll always be nights like this. <laughs> well, I... Now, you wait. Here comes a guy now. Turn on the charm and you nail him. No, no, you dance with him, Kate. Ah, uh, none of that. Stand up there and let me see you go to work. Come on, come on, get up. Well, I... I... Go on, talk to him. Uh, hello there. You want to dance? Oh, sure. And here's a ticket to one. Excuse me, Tay. By all means. My, but you're an awfully good dancer. Uh, <laughs> you just seem to have so much rhythm, don't you? Yeah. Uh, uh, do you come up here often? I certainly hope so. You, you just dance so wonderfully. Is there that another I... way out of here? Huh? Is there any way to get out besides from them front steps? Oh, yes, the forest gate. Where is it? Right behind those curtains in the back. We'll dance over there. Why? Please, just do as I say. You, you want to leave? That's right. But we just started dancing. Well, I... just let me. Why? You're hurt. It's nothing. Your, your shoulder is bleeding. Is this where the door is? Yes, but I, I. Take the rest of my tickets. Just let me go out. And do me a favor, will you? Forget you ever saw me. Wait. Huh? That shoulder. I, I can't let you. 
Look, I'm coming with you. The following morning in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting his fellow agent, Pat Walsh. Hello, Pat. Welcome back. Oh, thanks, Jim. How was the vacation? Great. Well, good. Oh, you've been in to see the boss yet? Yes, that's what I'm doing here. He wants me to work with you. Fine. Fine, I can use the help. Well, what's the story? A bank job. Four men held up the Travers National. Well, how'd they work? Well, one man went into the bank and did the actual job. Two others stood guard outside, and the fourth man stayed in the car. Any identification? Tell her at the bank saw the one who did the actual stick-up. No mask? Oh, yes. He had a handkerchief over his face. They got a coughing spell, and it slipped. Tell her it's downstairs now, going over our file of pictures. Any uh, dent on the others? No. You know, there's one thing about this holdup that puzzles me, though. Oh, what's that? Well, the bank is on a corner. The getaway car was parked right in front of it on Main Street. Yes. Now, when the bandit ran out of the bank, he didn't make for the car. Instead, he turned the corner onto 3rd Avenue and ran into the railroad station. Well, what happened then? According to a few of the eyewitnesses, one of the men in the gang ran after him, but he got away. The other two drove off in the car. That is odd. Did anybody think to get the license number of the car they used? Yes. Yes, the car turned up abandoned this morning. How much did they get? 18000 Excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes, Jack. He did? Belmont, huh? Yeah, fine. Thanks very much. That was the ident section. Teller just definitely identified a thief named Belmont as the man who did the job. Well, that's a break. They're sending us up Belmont's record. As soon as it gets here, we go to work. any better? Who are you? Sally. Sally? Oh, the girl from the dance hall. Yes, that's right. Where am I? <laughs> well, this is my place. I brought you here last night. I sure I, I bathed it and I put a bandage on. He made me promise not to call a doctor. Did you call one? No. Oh, thanks. Well, can you eat something? No. Not just yet. i got to be getting to work soon. What time is it? Almost six. At night? Yes. Uh, really, Bernard? Uh, wait a minute. What do you knock yourself out for? What do you mean? Bringing me here. Well, you needed help. I can't pay you nothing. I didn't expect nothing. I'm sorry. I... I know what it is to... It to be alone and you need somebody to help you. I suppose you've been wondering what this is all about. Why I got shot. I didn't ask you, did I? No. Now, there's some guys who want to get their hands on me. Gangsters? Yeah, I guess you'd call them that. Well, why don't you call the police? I can't. Why not? They'd help you. I'll explain some other time. you better get some more sleep. Are you leaving? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to work. Sally, huh? I'm going to ask you one more favor. Would you call the place I work? I'll give you the number. Tell them I won't be in. Sure, but I... But what? You never told me your name. Oh, it's Belmont. Tell me about that. Hi, Jim. Anything happened while I was out? Yeah, Bill called. He went out and examined the car that was used in the bank job, but he couldn't find a thing. Oh. Any news from the police? Uh -oh. How'd you make out? Well, I finally found the hotel where Belmont was living. Was living? Yes, he checked out the morning of the stick-up. One of the bellboys said that he took Belmont's bags down to the railroad station and checked them, but Belmont never came back for the claim checks. Oh, that's funny. I got the claim checks and went down to the station. The bags were still there. Did you go through them? Yes, but there wasn't anything in them that might be a lead... There's some shirts and socks and two old suits. Hmm, sounds like he intended to come back for the checks, but never got a chance. Yeah, I guess that must be it. He must have just grabbed the train when he ran into the railroad station. But did he have any friends at the hotel? No. No, he was a loner. But the clerk told me he was sick a lot, but he used the house doctor. Did you get to see him? Yes, he told me that Belmont has quite a bad case of tuberculosis. Uh, would explain the fit of coughing during the sit-up. Yes, it explains that, but it doesn't explain why he didn't use the getaway car. No. Jim? Hmm? I'm convinced of one thing. 
He ran into that railroad station on purpose. It wasn't just the first safe place. Yeah, I'm inclined to go along with you on that. I've got the switchboard working now on something that might prove you to be right. What's that? The doctor at the hotel told Belmont to go away to a sanitarium up in the mountains. Any particular one? No, I gave him a list of places. I got no part of it. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. Oh, yes? Oh, yes. Yes, thanks very much. Now, look, will you will you put a call through the police headquarters up there for me? No. That's fine. Thanks. That was the switchboard, Pat. They were working on that list. They've located Belmont at one of the sanitariums. Good. You hold down the office. I'm going to take a run up there right now. What happened to you last night? Why, I I went home. And what happened to that tall kid you were dancing with? Who? The tall kid, your last customer. Oh, oh, he he didn't feel good. He he needed some fresh air. So you went out the back door with him and down the fire escape. Well, how do you know? I saw you. Oh. Oh, look, Sally, I don't want to run your life, but be careful. What what do you mean? That tall kid is red hot. I don't understand, Pig. There was a guy in here last night right after you two left. He was looking for him. Huh? No. A hoodlum. And he's here again tonight. Where? He's walking toward us right now. In the brown suit? Yeah. Hey, what'll I do? It's too late for anything now, honey. I got some tickets here. I want to dance. With me, honey. No, honey. With her. But she's kind of tired. Shut up. Come on, sister. But I... I... Dance, I said. That's it. My, but you're an awfully good dancer. You, you just seem to have so much rhythm. Stop the routine. Where's Tommy Delmont? Who? The guy you took out of here the back way last night. I don't know what you're talking about. You took him out of here. He didn't go home, so he must have gone to your place. Where do you live? That's none of your business. Look, you'd better answer me. I don't have to. I don't have to dance with you either. Find yourself another girl. <laughs> Is that you, Sally? Yes, sir. Ain't this pretty early for you to be home? Yes. You didn't get fired on account of me, did you? No, Tony, no. I came home because... because you're in trouble. Well, what do you mean? A man came up to the dance hall. He was looking for you. What was his name? I don't know. He danced with me and he asked me where you were. What did you tell him? I said I didn't know. Oh, what did he look like? He's short with, with black hair and a mustache. And a scar on his right cheek? Yes, that's right. Marty Stokes. The guy who shot me. Well, what does he want? Nothing. I don't want to get you in trouble. I, I got to get out of here. Look, you can't get out of bed. You're too weak. Tommy. What? Please let me call the police. No. But he'll kill you. I know he will. Let me take care of myself. They shot you once. They'll kill you the next time. Please, Tommy. Honey, there's an awful good reason why I can't. But you... you... Look. I, I got a brother. He's older than me. His name's Frank. He's been in trouble ever since I can remember. Trouble? With the cops. Last week, three of his gang held up a bank. What? Yeah, they held up a bank. Frank found out the other three guys were going to double-cross him, so he beat them to it and ran away with the loot. Were you mixed up in it? No. They came to my house and talked to my landlady. She told him I'd gotten a phone call from my brother. Well, how did she know? The phone's in the hall, she answers. These guys want to know where Frank went with the money. I'm not going to tell him. Tommy, I think it's well you're that nice to your brother, but if it means getting killed, I... Sally, Frank is sick. So sick, he's only got about six months to live. That's why I can't go to the cops. I have to tell him where he is. I don't want him to spend his last few months in any prison. I understand. Tommy, what are you going to do? Well, one thing I got to do for sure... To get out of here. But you're safe here. You don't know that mob. They'll find out where you live. We've already found oh, out, Tommy. Marty. How did you get here? I followed you. Now get out of my way, sir. <laughs> okay, Tommy. Start talking. <laughs> We 
return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man in his 60s who is just about to have himself a vacation in Florida. Andy, how soon do you expect to get back to work? I'm never coming back to work, Mr. Keating. This vacation is going to last for the rest of my life. Well, you must have saved a lot of money to be able to retire these days. <laughs> we saved what we could. But what really fixed things up for my wife and me was my company's complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. That included a pension plan, too? That's right. Every month, as long as I live, the postman's going to hand me a check from the Equitable Society. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society was a mighty good thing for you, Andy. And it's just as good for your company. For three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yep. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income. Plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits. All in one package from the Equitable Society without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. Right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, a man does better work when he's rid of all those worries about sickness and accidents and his wife and kids' future. Andy, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from an Equitable Society expert. Get in touch with the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Runaway Dancer. Occasionally, there are extenuating circumstances which tempt a decent, right-thinking citizen either to consort with criminals or to shield a criminal by hiding something from the police. When that happens, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, that citizen thinks he is doing the right thing by following the dictates of his conscience. But in every case, and there are no exceptions, he is not only doing the wrong thing, but he is endangering himself. If a situation should ever arise in your life where you have some information which would help to solve a crime, even though it compromises someone near to you, there is only one step you can take, only one thing you can do which will be to your ultimate advantage. Call your local police. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from a visit to the sanitarium and is relaying his information to his fellow agent, Pat Walsh. Jim, did you find Belmont? Yes. Oh, where is he? He's still at the sanitarium under protective custody. I see. What did you get from him? He admitted taking part in the stick-up. I brought back his written confession. It's in on the boss's desk now. How much did he tell you? Everything. Including the names of his accomplices? Yes, he named the three others who worked on the job with him. I sent out alarms on all three. Isn't it kind of odd that Belmont talked so freely, Jim? He had a reason for talking. Well, what's that? He says that he found out the gang was going to double-cross him. So he decided to double-cross them instead and run away with the loot. Uh-huh. This morning, he just received word that the other three hoodlums are gunning for his kid brother and may kill him if he doesn't tell them where he's hiding. Well, that might be the truth, and then again, it might not. I think it might be for one reason, Pat. Belmont still has that money someplace, and he offered to make us a deal. Well, what kind of a deal? Well, we've got him, but we haven't got the money. He says that if we capture the other three and in that way remove his kid brother from any danger, he'll turn in the money. So our job now is to find the other three Confederates and Belmont's brother. That's it. And if Belmont's story is true, we'd better hurry. Tommy. What is it? You know I'm a nice fella. I don't like to hurt nobody. But I may have to start if you don't open up soon and tell me where your brother is. He has been telling you. He doesn't know. You keep out of this. He's right. I don't know where Frank is. Okay, kid. Let's forget about where he is. Make believe I'm not interested. We'll change the subject. Okay? Fine. Suppose you just tell me where he stashed the dough. I don't know that either. Look, Tommy. Believe me, if it was just me, 
I'd walk out of here and forget the whole thing. Then why don't you? What would I tell my partners? That I came here, you told me a story, that I was a big slob and said forget it. They wouldn't understand, kid. No? No. So why don't you make it easy for both of us? Tell me where we can find Frank or the dough and let me get out of here. The hundredth time, I don't know. Look, kid, I never belted anybody who was laying in bed. Don't make me break my record. You leave him alone. You hear what I'm saying, Tommy? I hear you. This is your last chance. Where's your brother? I don't know. Okay. I guess you gotta get the full treatment. Jim, we just got a phone call from police headquarters. On that alarm we sent out? Yes, they pulled a surprise raid and arrested two of the three men who worked with Belmont. Good. Now, which one is missing? Marty Stokes. Stokes, I know him. He's a killer. How about you? Do you have any luck? Yes, when I left here, I went up to the rooming house where Tommy Belmont lived. Mm-hmm. Anybody home? I spoke to his landlady. She told me Tommy hadn't been home last night at all. Well, sounds like Frank's story might be true. Exactly. Did you know where he works? Yes, in a garage on 11th Street. I went over there. Any luck? Well, I spoke to the garage manager. He said that he received a phone call earlier tonight about Tommy. Who called? What did he say? It was a she. She said that Tommy was sick and he wouldn't be in to work. Well, did he get her name? Just a first name. It was Sally. Well, that's not much help. No, but the manager remembered that she said she worked at the Rainbow Ballroom. On Main Street? Yes, that's the place. I called them. They have a hostess named Sally, but she wasn't there. Pat, I think we should go over to the Rainbow Ballroom. Pardon me, are you Miss Peg Jackson? Yeah. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What do you want? We'd like to ask you a few questions about your girlfriend, Sally Adams. What about Sally? What's happened to her? Nothing, we hope. No riddles, mister. Well, from what the manager says, Miss Adams just came to work here last week. That's right. And he says that because you girls get paid on the 1st and the 15th of the month, well, he still hasn't gotten her address. Well? Well, Miss Jackson, since you seem to be the only friend she had up here, we thought that you might know her address. You came to the wrong store, Mr. Taylor. I don't turn in my friends. We don't want to arrest Miss Adams, but she might be in very serious danger. We'd like to help her. Are you leveling? We have absolutely no reason to want to arrest Miss Adams. You can take our word for that. Okay. What do you want to know? Where does she live? I don't know. I went there last Thursday night with her after work, but we went in the cab and we were talking all the way. You know the way it is. You don't pay much attention. Yes, I understand. Do you remember anything about the house? Mm, yeah, it was number 333. But I don't know what street it was on because there was so much excitement. Oh, about what? There was a big fire right across the street. Miss Jackson, can you remember what kind of building was on fire? I think it was a store. Why? We may be able to check the fire department records and see what fires they covered on Thursday night. Oh, I see. Miss Jackson, did you take the cab to Miss Adams' home from here in front of the dance hall? Yeah, we did. Now, this is very important. Do you remember how much the cab fare was? Um, let's see. I paid it. Uh, the meter read 60 cents. Well, that means it's less than two miles from here. Pat, let's get a map of the city and check with the fire department on what fires they covered within a radius of two miles of here last Thursday night. Okay, Jim. A fire across the street from a building numbered 333 ought to give us Sally Adams' address. <laughs> Tommy. Tommy. All right, break it up, break it up. <laughs> Get away from the guy. It's time I went back to work. No, you can't hit him anymore. He's unconscious now. I just want to bring him to... No! Shh! Look. I told you before about that screaming. If anybody comes in here, your boyfriend never gets off that bed. Now, get away. Don't hit him anymore, please. I ain't going to hit him. I give you my word. All right, Tommy. Come around. Come on. Is that water in that glass? Yes. Give me. Here. All right, Tommy. What? Come on. What? What? That's it. What is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Look, I ain't working out on you anymore, kid. Do you hear that? Yeah. I got a better way to get my information. 
I'm using your girlfriend here. Huh? Yeah. Let me lift you up a minute. <clears throat> there. I want you to have a ringside seat for the main attraction. Leave her alone, Marty. Come here, sweetheart. No, let go of me. Now watch this, Tommy. <laughs> Wait, you... And this will keep up till you decide to do business. You want her to take any more? Taking enough, Stark. Uh, who are you? From the FBI. Oh. Uh, Jim, he's taking a break. Oh, no, he isn't. Thanks, Stokes. Thanks for trying to get away. Mister, you're, you're not going to arrest Tommy. Oh, no, Miss Adams. You take care of Tommy. We'll take care of Stokes. Marty Stokes was given a 25-year sentence in federal prison for bank robbery. The other members of his gang were sentenced to 15 years each for their part in the crime. And thus, by careful deduction and painstaking investigation, your FBI was able not only to round up the four criminals who wantonly robbed a bank, but also to save two young innocent people from further sadistic torture meted out by a brutal thug. In this case, as in so many others, time was an all-important factor. And for that reason, the special agents assigned to this case worked through the night. Criminals have no office hours. And as many of them have learned to their regret, neither does your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For almost 20 years, we have provided our employees with group life, health, and accident insurance, writes Mr. J.W. Glenn, president of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And we consider that this insurance, one of our many benefit plans, contributes greatly to the morale and security of our employees. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case involving crime on a tropical island. Its subject, jewel theft. Its title, The Flying Felon. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Flying Felon on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.